All right, Revelation chapter 6. I'll begin at verse 1, and I'll read to verse 8, and we'll get into our study. I chose to entitle this installment, and so it begins. Beginning at verse 1, Now I saw when the Lamb opened one of the seals, and I heard one of the four living creatures saying with a loud saying with a voice like thunder, Come and see. And I looked, and behold, a white horse. He who sat on it had a bow, and a crown was given to him, and he went out conquering and to conquer. When he opened the second seal, I heard the second living creature saying, Come and see. Another horse, fiery red, went out, and it was granted to the one who sat on it to take peace from the earth and that people should kill one another. There was given to him a great sword. When he opened the third seal, I heard the third living creature say, Come and see. So I looked, and behold, a black horse, and he who sat on it had a pair of scales in his hand. I heard a voice in the midst of the four living creatures saying, A quart of wheat for a denarius and three quarts of barley for a denarius, and do not harm the oil and the wine. When he opened the fourth seal, I heard the voice of the fourth living creature saying, Come and see. So I looked, and behold, a pale horse, and the name of him who sat on it was Death. And Hades followed with him, and power was given to them over a fourth of the earth to kill with sword, with hunger, with death, and by the beasts of the earth. So we have a very cheery Bible study that we'll be going through today. As we begin to look here at the breaking of the seals, uh, let me give you a brief introduction and develop my opening, and then we'll move into our study. The Bible teaches that we are moving towards a final war. It's really a series of, or campaigns, but it's referred to Armageddon. We see that in Revelation 16. You see, instead of the world moving towards a time of peace and prosperity, the opposite really is true. The world is continuing its slow movement to greater evil and continual war. Paul wrote that the time before Jesus' return would be difficult. It would even be violent. He had written in 2 Timothy 3, verse 1, Know this, that in the last days perilous times will come. The word perilous speaks of that which is difficult, even speaks of violence. And so we know that that is true. Dangerous times will come. We, we see this in our day right now. We see it transitioning right before our eyes of the, the nation that many of us have been born into and grown up in, a nation whose morality continues to decline. We know that very often in people's thinking, morality is often determined by what is legal. I'll give you an example. Since 1944, California law permitted a judge to, to decide if a man should be placed on the California Sex Offender Registry if he had had physical intercourse with a minor. The intercourse was between a man and girl who was between 14 and 17, and the man was no more than 10 years older than the person. But just this last September, a bill was signed into law by Governor Newsom permitting homosexual men to have consensual intercourse with a boy between 14 and 17 years of age. Did you know that? Some of you didn't. The promoter of the bill said that this would bring equality to LGBTQ young people. But critics recognized this as a bill essentially legalizing pedophilia. You see, in Philippians chapter 3, verses 18 and 19, Paul said it like this. He said, For as I have often told you before, and now say again, even with tears, many live as enemies of the cross of Christ. Their destiny is destruction, their God is their stomach, and their glory is in their shame. Their mind is on earthly things. Their glory is in their shame. People have forgotten how to blush. They don't have a standard as to what is right, what is acceptable, what is moral. And so because many Americans base their morality on what is legal, that's why you have people arguing with you concerning smoking pot and 
and uh, things like that, you know, pornography, they'll argue with you. If it's legal, it's okay. Well, because of that, we have seen a decline in the morality of the United States and all of that, and evil is becoming more and more acceptable. Remember when Jesus was asked, what will be the sign of your coming and the end of the age? Well, when he was asked that question in Matthew 24, he went on to list various signs that would point to his return. In Matthew 24, verse 7, it says, Nation will rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom. There will be famines, pestilences, and earthquakes in various places. In verse 9 of Matthew 24, he went on to say, They will deliver you up to tribulation and kill you. You will be hated by all nations for my name's sake. And then in verses 11 and 12 of Matthew 24, he said, Many false prophets will rise up and deceive many and because lawlessness will abound, the love of many will grow cold. Jesus said there'll be increasing famines, pestilence, earthquake, and an increase of hate. And the hatred, he said, will be especially targeted at his followers. Again in Matthew 24, 9, remember it says, They will deliver you up to tribulation and kill you. You will be hated by all nations for my name's sake. Now, today, many preachers disregard the obvious need for the church to wake up. They do not call people to repentance. They're not calling people to follow the Lord. Instead of calling people to repent and serve Jesus, they, they are giving what is called a watered-down message. It, it's similar today. It's similar to the time of Jeremiah, the prophet. When God warned Israel of coming judgment, God told Jeremiah to speak out against the, the messages being preached to the people. Jeremiah 6, 14, it says, God said, they, speaking of false prophets, they have also healed the hurt of my people slightly, saying, peace, peace, when there is no peace. You see, the false teachers didn't preach a message that would clean out the infection. When he says they are healing my people slightly, it's a way of saying that they're not cleansing the wound. They're allowing it to continue with the messages that they're giving, peace, peace. They're saying, but God said, there is no peace. You see, this kind of message of peace will be preached by false teachers in the last days. There'll be a, a message of peace that is finally possible. Conflict will finally cease. Look at us today, right now, here in the United States, where people are saying, we need more peace. Look at the riots. Look at the wars. Look at the things that are going on. People want peace. But the Bible in 1 Thessalonians 5.3 says, when they say peace and safety, then sudden destruction comes upon them as labor pains upon a pregnant woman, and they shall not escape. Is this true? Is the world finally going to get along and live in peace with one another? Well, as we read our Bible, God's word seems to be clear. In the last days, there will be escalating judgments on the world. Now, this time of judgment, this seven-year period in Scripture is... Uh, is uh, there are various words used to, to speak of it. You have Daniel's 70th week. It's also a time of Jacob's trouble. It's referred to as the tribulation, and it's also referred to as great tribulation, this time of God pouring out his wrath. Now, when we were in chapter 5, John introduced a seven-sealed scroll, a book, which was the title deed of the earth. Now here in chapter 6, the first six seals of the book are broken. And as we see this, each of the seals represent judgment that's coming upon the earth. Now the events that unfold before us as we're reading are events that were still in the future to both John as well as to us. The breaking of these seals precedes and introduces judgments to come after the rapture. The picture of the church in heaven has already been revealed in chapters 4 and 5. We saw in chapter 5 how the 24 elders, which represent the church, how the 24 elders had, had sung a song of the redeemed. That is a song sung by the church. So as we go through chapters 6 through 19, we see that the church is not found in the tribulation. The church was prominent in chapters 2 and 3, but will not be seen again until chapter 19. The church is reintroduced at the second coming of Christ mentioned in chapter 20 and is mentioned again in chapter 22, verse 16. Now, when we first moved to this place, I received a letter from one of the neighbors. And they, they said, I wish you weren't here. That's what they said. 
And so I told Marie, you didn't have to tell me that in a letter. You could have come and told me face to face. But they did. They wrote it. It was like two or three page letter. And it said, we, we, I, I wish you weren't here. Before you came here, we had peace in this neighborhood. And now we don't have peace. I'll never forget that. Well, the bottom line is, is the, the writer of that letter didn't see the value of the church, didn't see the value of the church in the world. For them, we disturbed their peace. We were non-essential. But is this true? Are we simply unnecessary for the people of the world? We need to think of what the church actually does. The church evangelizes. The church disciples. The church cares for people. The church reveals God's grace, God's love, God's truth. You need to remember that we are the only organization that has been created specifically to care for the needs of other people. In Philippians chapter 2, Paul said it like this. He said in verses 14 and 15, In everything you do, stay away from complaining and arguing so that no one can speak a word of blame against you. You are to live clean, innocent lives as children of God, in a dark world full of crooked and perverse people, let your lives shine brightly before them. You see, we exist for a variety of things, including the reason to restrain evil from completely dominating the world. The church exists to restrain evil. As Jesus surveyed the world, he saw it in a state of moral decay. He saw it in spiritual darkness. So to influence the world for Jesus, his disciples needed to know who they were. So in Matthew 5, 13 and 14, he said, you are the salt of the earth. But if the salt loses its flavor, how shall it be seasoned? It's then good for nothing but to be thrown out and trampled underfoot by men. He went on to say, you are the light of the world. A city that is set on a hill cannot be hidden. When you look at that and you read that and you develop that and you look at the tenses in the Greek language, you'll see that Jesus is saying, you are the only salt and you are the only light. That's the purpose of the church. So the people today may think that we are not necessary, that we don't need to meet together, that we shouldn't worship together. They think that's no big deal. They think that we're not essential. But Revelation 6 through 19 gives us a glimpse into what happens when the church is no longer present. Now remember, in chapter 5, the Lamb, in the midst of the throne, took the scroll out of the hand of the Father. And when opened, the scroll reveals the future of planet Earth, and it's a time of unparalleled judgment. We see seven seal judgments, and the seven seal judgments lead to seven trumpet judgments, and the seven trumpet judgments culminate in seven bowl judgments. And those judgments, as mentioned, are escalating in severity. We know that the number seven is often a picture of completion. So these judgments, numbering seven, represents total judgment. And so that's what we're looking at. So in verse one of chapter six, I saw when the lamb opened one of the seals and I heard one of the four living creatures saying with a loud voice like thunder, come and see. This introduces the tribulation. Chapters 6 through 19 give detailed account of this period of time. Now, earlier, Jesus was revealed as the one who is worthy to open and loose the seven seals. So the Lamb opens the seals and introduces the time of judgment, the tribulation. And the first seal is open. He says, I saw when the Lamb opened one of the seals, I heard one of the four living creatures saying with a, with a voice like thunder, Come and see, a voice like thunder. So when the first seal is open, John hears this voice. And a voice like, uh, like thunder is a, a symbol of a coming storm. We see that in Exodus chapter 9, verse 23, where Moses stretched forth his rod toward heaven. The Lord sent thunder and hail, and the fire ran along the ground, and the Lord rained hail upon the land of Egypt. So that's a symbol of a coming storm. And that begins the seven-year period of God pouring out his wrath on a Christ-rejecting world. You see, in the beginning of the tribulation, it will eventually lead to what is called the great tribulation. In Jeremiah 30, verse 7, it says, Alas, for that day is great, so that none is like it, and it is the time of Jacob's trouble. 
In, in Matthew 24, 21, Jesus said, Then shall be great tribulation, such as was not since the beginning of the world to this time, no, nor ever shall be. And so we're seeing the opening of the tribulation that leads to the great tribulation. And he says, I saw the lamb open one of the seals. And in verse 2, it says, And behold, he says, I looked, and behold, a white horse, and he who sat on it had a bow, and a crown was given to him, and he went out conquering and to conquer. In the opening of the first seal, we're introduced here to this horseman. There are many who think this rider is Jesus, but J. Vernon McGee, some of you know him and know of his name, J. Vernon McGee said it like this, it would be pretty difficult for the Lord Jesus, who's the one opening the seals, now to make a quick change, mount a horse, and come riding forth. Other believe that, others believe that he symbolizes the conditions that give rise to the Antichrist. The other writers symbolizes force, symbolize forces like war, famine, and death. This writer would symbolize peace, the worldwide false peace that exists under Antichrist. Notice the rider on the white horse. He has a bow and a crown. He goes forth conquering. We know that there'll be a peace, time of peace, and we know that Antichrist will go forth, and he will appear as the Messiah, and he will initially conquer peacefully. He'll do it through deception which results in a false peace in the world. Notice he has a bow, but he doesn't have any arrows. This will be a bloodless victory at the beginning. He's given a crown. Now, the word crown here speaks of a victor's crown. It's not a king's crown. It's a victor's crown. That speaks of conquering, victory. That isn't a crown of a king. It's a crown given for a triumph. And he's given a crown because he's made world peace possible. And I, I can't help but wonder if this is speculation. It doesn't say it here. But when I, I read that and was studying that and preparing the study, I, I saw a prize, a peace prize. I wonder if he's going to be somebody who's like that, people who have won the Nobel Peace Prize. He's going to be somebody that people will follow. And initially, he's going to be um, uh, conquering in a peaceful way. Notice again, I pointed this out. He has a bow. It has no arrows. That's a bloodless victory. He's going to conquer through a false message preached by false teachers and false prophets. You see, in the days before the rapture, the church has already become increasingly influenced towards apostasy. After the rapture, it's going to be fully possible for many, much, many more people to become apostate or to reject the message of Christ. Remember, I mentioned a moment ago that Matthew records a question that was asked of Jesus, and that question had to do with events that would take place before his return. In Matthew 24, 3 through 5, it says, As he sat on the Mount of Olives, the disciples came to him privately, saying, Tell us, when shall these things be? What shall be the sign of your coming and the end of the world? And Jesus answered and said to them, Take heed that no man deceives you. For many shall come in my name, saying, I am Christ, and shall deceive many. What is the sign? Notice that. He didn't say, they didn't say, what are the signs? Jesus goes on to give many things. But they asked a specific question, what is the sign? And Jesus answered very specifically, deception. What is it? It will be deception. Deception will increase. It negates the place of the church as the disseminator of truth. You may or may not realize that as a Christian. But truth is, is deposited in the gospel, and the church is supposed to be disseminating or giving that out. You see, in 1 Timothy 3, verse 15, that, that verse refers to the church as the pillar and ground of the truth. But in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verses 9 and 10, Paul said the coming of the lawless one, the Antichrist, will be in accordance with the work of Satan, displayed in all kinds of counterfeit miracles, signs and wonders, and in every sort of evil that deceives those who are perishing, they perish because they refuse to love the truth and so be saved. A refusal to love Christ who is the truth and his message of truth. So how is this going to happen, this bloodless victory? Well, through deception. Through deception, an atmosphere of false security and peace will exist. And much of this deception will actually come from within the church itself. In Jeremiah chapter 14, verses 13 to 15, it says, Then I said, O oh Lord God, Behold, the prophets say to them, you shall not see the sword, 
nor shall you have famine. But I will give you assured peace in this place. And the Lord said to me, the prophets prophesy lies in my name. I have not sent them, commanded them, nor spoken to them. They prophesy to you a false vision, divination, a worthless thing, and the deceit of their heart. Therefore, thus says the Lord concerning the prophets who prophesy in my name, whom I did not send, and who say, sword and famine shall not be in the land. By sword and famine, those prophets shall be consumed. And so it begins first through deception, a false message. And then in verse 3, he opened the second seal. I heard the second living creature saying, come and see. Another horse, fiery red, went out, and it was granted to the one who sat on it to take peace from the earth, and that people should kill one another. And there was given to him a great sword. And so the second seal is opened, and a succession of wars will break out. These wars are symbolized by the sword. Early in the tribulation, world peace will actually lead to world conflict. The false peace that has been established by the Antichrist will not last long. Man's attempt at world peace will never succeed. It's always short-lived. Notice how this second horse is fiery red. Fiery red is the color of fire and blood. It represents war and violence. And this rider, this rider takes peace from the earth. He says, people kill one another. And that's a great sword that he's using. The word sword here is, a, is the short stabbing sword that was used by assassins. It's called a great sword because it speaks to, of the extent of the warfare. So the Antichrist will resort to war to maintain his power and control the world. And the Bible makes it clear that the Antichrist will be an extraordinary military ruler. In Daniel 8, verse 24, it says he'll become very strong, but not by his own power. He will cause astounding devastation and will succeed in whatever he does. He will destroy those who are mighty, the holy people. So he's going to be an extraordinary military ruler. The peace that is established that people begin to cry out, oh, it's a time of peace. That won't last that long. This is all taking place within the first three and a half years of the tribulation. And so there'll be wars that begin because his peace won't last. Jesus said that escalating wars would occur before his return. Again, in Matthew 24, verses six and seven, he said, you will hear of wars and rumors of wars. See that you're not troubled for all these things must come to pass. But the end is not yet. Nation will rise against nation, kingdom against kingdom. There will be famines, pestilences, and earthquakes in various places. Wars. Before Billy Graham went to heaven, Billy Graham said that out of 5,000 years of history, there has been 4,000 years of war. In the first portion of the 20th century, millions died in two world wars. It is estimated that 16 million military personnel died and 37 million civilians died in World War I. World War II accounted for an estimated 75 million deaths, including 40 million civilians. And the world has gone through this before, and the world even now is poised for war. We see this all unfolding even as I'm reading this to you. At this time, there are 30 countries in which nuclear power plants operate. Only France, Belgium, and Slovakia use them as primary source of electricity. According to the World Nuclear Association, over 30 countries are giving serious consideration to introducing a nuclear power capability, including Iran, the United Arab Emirates, Vietnam, and Jordan. Belarus, Bangladesh, and Turkey are at the forefront. At this time, there are nine countries designated nuclear weapon states, China, France, Russia, United Kingdom, the United States, India, Pakistan, North Korea, and Israel. Belgium, Germany, Netherlands, Italy, and Turkey are NATO nuclear sharing states. Third world nations with aggressive plans are increasing. Terrorism is on the increase, and the stage is already being set. And so as this continues on, verse 5, when he opened the third seal, 
I heard the third living creature say, come and see. So I looked, behold, a black horse, and he who sat on it had a pair of scales in his hand. And I heard a voice in the midst of the four living creatures saying, a quart of wheat for a denarius, three quarts of barley for a denarius, and do not harm the oil and the wine. Escalating wars. With escalating wars, famine hits. The world food supplies will be destroyed. Again, in Matthew 24, 7, Jesus said there will be famines, pestilences, and earthquakes in various places. In verse 6, the pair of scales symbolizes rationing. With famine always comes inflation. A quart of wheat barely feeds one person in a day, and barley will provide very little for families. A person's daily wage barely provides low-quality food enough for a small family, is what he's saying there. But notice in verse 6 how he says, harm not the oil and wine. Oil and wine are necessities in many places, but are also considered luxury items. So it could very well be a picture of how the affluent, the rich will survive, but the poor don't. It's always been true that though there are those who, are, who can be very rich. There are some very generous and very kind and believing people who are rich. I'm not knocking richness at all, but bottom line is there are quite a number of people who, who, who have positions of power, authority, and finance that really don't concern themselves very much with those who don't have that. So we can be told, don't go out and eat. You need to stay home. And we have our governor who goes, here we go, shouldn't have done this. <laughs> but we have a governor who goes out and spends $350 a plate. Think about that for a minute. I wonder how many of you remember or knew that. Maybe you do. That's what he did. He told us, stay home. He said, don't celebrate Thanksgiving. But anyway, I won't go there. Don't worry. You already are there. I'm just kind of letting, you, letting that percolate for a moment. The poor become poor, and the rich get richer. That's usually how it works. The rich who say to others, don't be concerned with your daily food. You don't need to be. Well, they're rich, and they have money, so they don't have to be concerned. It's not that the poor should be always worried about it, but there's a fact of life that, that when, I, when I don't have any money, I certainly do have concern for my family and myself. Of course I do. And so this is a picture not only of the fact that there'll be an incredible inflation, but it's also a picture of a fact that the rich get richer and the poor get poorer. And so there goes the word, harm not the oil and wine, harm not the luxury items, because the affluent will survive, but the poor don't. In verse 7, you see, and when he opened the fourth seal, I heard the voice of the fourth living creature saying, come and see. So I looked, and behold, a pale horse, and the name of him who sat on it was death. And Hades followed with him, and power was given to them over a fourth of the earth to kill with sword, with hunger, with death, and by the beasts of the earth. A pale horse. It's interesting, the word pale, you'll recognize it when I tell you the word in the Greek is chloros. Chloros. It's where you get the word um, chlorine from. The word pale is, a, is yellow. It's a yellow green. Yellow, yellow green, one commentator pointed out, is used as a picture of the color of a corpse, the dead body, becomes a pale yellow green. This is a picture of death. It may be, and I'll, I'll develop this with you for a moment. It may be that this death that is being pictured here comes through an infectious disease. Death in Hades speaks of dying and the abode of the dead, which actually completes the picture. Now, at first, death and destruction will be limited to the quarter, to a quarter of the Earth's population. The world population clock, 2020, says there are 7.8 billion people worldwide right now. So in this, say it were to happen in our time, 
This means that almost 2 billion people are going to die. Almost 2 billion people are going to die. To give a way to measure this, according to the European Center for Disease Prevention and Control, as of December 3rd, 2020, there have been 1,495,000 deaths due to COVID-19. Death on a large scale is the natural result of wars and disease. John says that these deaths will occur in various ways. Notice he said sword, which is the war, famine, death. The word death there is a general word, general word speaking of pestilence, and through natural disasters, which he speaks of as being animals. Now, to some, this seems to be exaggerated. Perhaps this man was writing with just dramatic imagery. The fact is, these kinds of things have existed in the past. Famine. In 1959 through 1961, it was reported that 30 million died of starvation. 30 million died of starvation in northern China. The World Health Organization estimates that 3.1 million children die of hunger yearly. He speaks of pestilence. In 1918 and 1919, it is estimated that about 500 million people, or one-third of the world's population, became infected with the Spanish flu virus. The number of deaths was estimated to be at least 50 million worldwide, with about 675,000 occurring in the United States. My aunt and my uncle died of the Spanish flu at that time. My mother's older, older brother and older sister, both of them died of the Spanish flu in 1918 and 1919. Worldwide, there are over 400,000 malaria deaths a year. The World Health Organization says that 1.5 million die from tuberculosis. UNICEF says yearly over 800,000 children die of pneumonia. When I was in the Philippines a number of years ago, I had an opportunity while being in Manila to meet a pastor who had a, a church that he, with his hands, he built the building in a dump there called the Tundo Dump. And when I went there to go and see what his ministry was there in the slum, in a dump, a literal dump in uh, Manila, I, I'll never forget the impact that had on me because we went into this dump and it's just, it's very, it's very large. It's a, a lot of, lot of um, well, there are people who live there. They actually go to the, they go to the um, trash and they dig out, cardboard or pieces of wood that's been thrown away, and they build houses there. They build houses. They live in the Tundo dump. And so we went into the dump, and, and this pastor had been uh, scavenging through all the trash, and he had found a lot of plywood and various things, and he took us to his church. And we walked into this little church that he had built that would seat maybe 60 to 80 people, and he had his his, his pews that he had built out of discarded wood, and they were lopsided and all, and, uh, you know, just pieces of wood that he had hammered together so people could come and they could hear the gospel. I'll never forget as I was walking through this particular area, little boys, there was one little boy who ran past me, could have been about seven years old, and he had a, 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 a can, an empty can, and he had tied string through it, and it was and he was running with it as it was hitting the rocks and things, making noise. And I'll never forget this little boy running past me as I saw the can bouncing in him. He was laughing and, and having a great time. And I'm looking at him. My heart's touched by these things. I see two, three other little boys who have found a, a ball that was, it was flat. It, 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 had, it, it couldn't hold any air, but they had built themselves a little basketball uh, hoop and they were shooting baskets with this deflated ball. And I've seen this one thing after another after another. The poverty was unbelievable. And there's this man's church, and he's reaching to these people and wanting them to know Jesus Christ. And he had a little girl. Her, her, she, was, she was 12 years old. She was 12 years old. And I thought she was seven. She was so small. Just a little girl. And she became my guide. 
And I was walking with her, and she reached up and took me by the hand and held my hand as we walked through the dump. And I was just touched by her. I was moved by this little girl, so stinking sweet, such a beautiful baby. I just, I just fell in love with her, and, and a few months later, I got word that she died. She died of measles. She died of measles. Who dies of measles? She did. She did. I've spoken to the church on this way, in this way many times. God has been gracious for me to go places to see things that not everybody has the chance to see. The, the Manila, so many areas in this beautiful city that is, well, people are building houses on, on sidewalks in front of other people's houses, and they're building them out of cardboard or, or plywood. To go to India, to be in Bombay, and, and to arrive in an airport where they have double-paned glass because the smell of rotten decay is so intense it even seeps through double pane. Then you step into the humidity and the, and the smell, and, and you drive to the hotel they're taking you to, and, and there are people who have built little structures on traffic islands, and they're living on that island. That's where they live. The poverty is unbelievable. And to know that when the monsoon season hits in Bombay, there are more rats on the street than human beings. To know that and to see that, and then to go to a temple to see what they're doing there and to watch children begging for food in front of the temple while well, the people going into the temple don't give the children food. They give it to rats that are there in the temple. To see that, it impacts you. It always will. I've seen a lot of that. And I've seen the pestilence. I've seen the result of it. And it breaks your heart. It breaks your heart. You see, when you look at this, I want you to notice it speaks of animals. They're on the list of causes of death. And, and people might say, why animals? Are, are you saying that they're going to come running out of, you know, dogs will chase you down the street and bite you? No. Rats have been responsible for millions of deaths. We know that in the 1300s, the Black Death, the Black Plague, was passed on by fleas. And during that time, between a quarter and a third of Europe's population was wiped out through these animals. I actually looked up this, this information, and there's a, a site called Pest World. Can you believe that? Pest World. But according to Pest World, rats and mice are known to spread more than 35 diseases. And so what you're seeing here are judgments that are going to come. One after another, after another, after another. This lamb that John saw, when they had, he had heard the words that that the lion has prevailed, and he looks, and behold, there was a lamb, this lamb. This lamb that you and I think of as Jesus Christ, that's who he is, the lamb of God, who takes away the sin of the world. We, we see him as gentle, and we see him as loving, because he is. We see him as merciful and kind, because he is. We see him as he ministers to the blind. As you read your Gospels, you, you see how Jesus provides food for the hungry. You see how Jesus heals the sick. He he cleanses the leper. He casts out demons from the demonized people. You see this, and he's, he's righteous, and he's glorious, and he's kind, and he's warm, and he's so approachable that you see his cousin, uh, John, who's, willing, who's able to put his, his head on the chest of Christ. The warmth and the love and the tenderness of this man and, and the love they have for one another. I've always thought that the picture of John placing his head on the, the bosom of Christ is, 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 is a picture of a tender, loving act of relationship, of communion, because John, having his head on Jesus' chest, can hear the heartbeat of God. And there's just something amazing about that thought. And that's the man that we love, Jesus Christ, the Lamb, the Lamb of God, the one who went to the cross, the one who died, the one who prayed. Father, he said, uh, you know, forgive them. They know not what they do. That one, that Jesus, the one who was buried in the third day that he arose, he arose from the dead. That one who ascended to heaven 40 days later. That one. Don't get them mad. 
because we see him as the lamb. But as I was sharing with you, the lamb is a lion. Because there are flashes of the holy wrath of Christ that we see in the Gospels. We have a tendency, I think, of, of seeing him as he is, loving, gracious, kind. A woman has been caught in sin. He doesn't condemn her. We see these things, forgives people, loves people. But he also goes into the temple and cleans it out twice. My father's house is a house of prayer. You have made it into a den of thieves. He fashions a whip and he drives them out, turns over their tables. We think that he won't do that again, but he does. John points it out. This lion, this lamb, well, the lion is pouring out his wrath. He's pouring out his wrath. And as he does so, the judgments begin to flow. There are greater and even more terrible judgments that will come. We're going to be seeing this leading to trumpets, what are called trumpet judgments. And then we're going to see them as they lead quickly to the bowl judgments. And they're going to come through Jesus Christ because he's going to reveal himself as holy and true. And when these things come to pass, those who have rejected Jesus as their Savior are going to see him in his wrath. In Hebrews 10.31, the writer said, it's a terrifying thing to fall into the hands of the living God. You see, this is sure. This is the word of God. This is sure. This is going to happen. This isn't some fanciful tale, some mythological fable of some sort. This is pre-written history. This is God saying, this is what is going to take place. We see it already. We're seeing how the world is primed right now. We see it. Primed right now for a world leader, somebody who can, can stop the wars between so many countries, who can put a time of peace, who will set up a peace treaty, and the people will say, this is amazing. And the Antichrist, as we'll see, is going to do that. There'll be peace treaties and things that are set up, and people will say, this is an amazing man. This is an amazing warrior who can make war with him. Who can stand up like him? Who can stand against him? Who is like him? The Antichrist. Popular. People will love him. I've already seen how, how we can be deceived by a smile and a promise. America can be deceived, has been, for a smile and a promise. And none of it's going to take place. But eventually, there'll be one who comes, a man referred to in Scripture by various names, the willful king, the Antichrist, the beast. And he's going to strike a deal. They'll be saying, peace. But when they cry, peace, peace, sudden destruction will come upon them, like a woman having birth pangs. So what's the key, guys? This is going to happen. What's the key for me? I can tell you it's very quick, and I'll say it quickly in my conclusion here. Get right with God. Get right with God. Jesus, his word is true. He doesn't lie. He's returning, and he's going to be mad. That's a fact. That's a fact. And these things we're seeing unfold in front of us. We're seeing the conditions. They're already set up. We're seeing it before our very eyes. How people will wonder and follow after a leader who makes promises. We've seen it already. We've seen how quickly people will follow those orders. They follow them quickly and, and even will get mad at you if you don't. We see it now. It's here. It's happening. It's happening. And the church is dump, 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 dump. We're seeing it. We're seeing it. It's just the beginning. We're being preconditioned. We're being preconditioned. No, I'm not a doomsday prophet. I'm just telling you the truth. We're seeing it. I wondered for the longest time, 
How is that possible? You need to remember that in my age, I've seen a lot of changes. I've seen a lot of changes. A lot of changes. From what it was like in the 50s when I grew up, where you wouldn't even have Lucille Ball, I said this before, Lucille Ball and Desi Arnaz in I Love Lucy. They didn't sleep together. They had separate beds, and yet somehow they had little Ricky. I never figured that one out. And we saw things that were innocent. That's the point I'm making. How innocent we were as a nation. Where we have people today saying, you shouldn't say Merry Christmas. It's offensive. To who? The Antichrist? You can't say that. Say Happy Holidays. What holiday? What are you talking about? And I grew up in a time when Jewish comedians like Jack Benny and others would actually have Christmas specials. And guess what? They weren't upset. They weren't upset. But if somebody whines and cries long enough and pouts like a four-year-old, then everybody shuts up. Oh, I don't want to offend you. Well, guess what? Uh, I better not go there. <laughs> you already know. You already know. I did a, oh, I might as well say this. I did a Facebook Live the other day that some of you might have seen. I got good response, praise the Lord. Don't, I don't read the comments because there are a lot of trolls out there. But I said it. Listen, we have Mr. Obama lecturing me as a Hispanic. I don't like to use the word Hispanic. It's a general term. I'm Mexican. But I, as a Hispanic, He's lecturing me that the reason I voted for Trump, which I did, surprise, surprise, is because, because Trump uh, had made promises on, he's, he called us Hispanic evangelicals. Some of you perhaps heard him, Hispanic evangelicals. He said that's the reason he was voted in. I, and I wrote, I said, Mr. Mr., uh, Mr. Obama, uh, one, um, Presidents who are past presidents normally fade away, but you, you don't seem to want to shut up. That's one thing. Uh, two, well, that's true. See, you know, get mad at me, it's okay. Um, but I said, you know, uh, I didn't vote for him because of what he says. I voted for him for what he's done. He's done some good things. And, and, and that's, what I, that's why I voted for him. That's why I voted for him. And I said, you know, it's just, it's just a good idea for us to, um, to not be boxed. I said, to be honest with you, I've, I feel a, a, an insult, that you're insulting me because you're trying to categorize me. No, it's not because I want to cling to my guns and my God. It's because what I've seen him do has been good for this nation. That this is a man who gave up his salary every year. He gave up his salary to charity where you, Mr. Obama, uh, you came into office with $1.3 million and you now have $40 million. How did you get that? How did that happen? You see, guys, we're living in a time where people like me saying this, there'll be people who won't be back next week. All right, God, God bless you. <laughs> you know, somebody's got to speak truth. And isn't the preacher supposed to do that? Aren't we supposed to do that? We are. You know, and I'm seeing this take place, guys, and I'm concerned. I'm concerned for those who are being deceived. I'm concerned for pastors who are forgetting to preach the gospel because they're afraid of offending sensitive hearers. Guess what? The gospel is offensive. It is offensive. It, it, that's what it is. When it's actually preached, when it's actually taught, it is offensive. But guess what? When you, when you come to faith in Christ, your life is, your sins are forgiven, your life is transformed, you're blessed by God, you go to heaven, so we preach the gospel. God can change lives. And Jesus Christ is returning. This, this lion, this lamb, this lamb is going to return as a lion. And there's going to be a time of wrath, but you can escape it. It, as I just read, is a terrifying thing to fall into the hands of the living God. 
And if there's anything that is a symbol of a person who doesn't know God, the Bible says it this way, there is no fear of God in them. There is no fear of God in them. I don't want to, I'm not, I, uh, uh, one, one more thing, um, <laughs> might as well. There are words that you do not hear on TV. They will not, they're, un, they're, they're banned words. And we all know those banned words. And those words shouldn't be used. But the same program that will not use this banned word uses God's name in vain. And I see that. And God said, I will not hold him guiltless who uses my name in vain. That's the one thing he says. I will not hold them guiltless. He who uses my name in vain. And yet we will use his name in vain. But we won't use other words. That's the twisted morality of the nation we live in, where you blaspheme God, but don't offend this person over here. We got to, I'm not saying be mean. Let's close with joy. I'm not saying be mean. God knows. Anybody who knows me, knows our church, knows my heart, knows my tenderness, that I love people. God knows that. You do too. Most of you do. I love people, but I'll tell you the truth. Because love means you tell the truth. And I am. I'm trying to be honorable before God. I stand before him one day. How did you treat my gospel? He could ask me. And I want to say I did my best to remain faithful to it, Lord, and to your message. Because Jesus, Jesus is coming. There are no other, there are no other prophecies that need to be fulfilled. The next one is the rapture of the church. And when the rapture of the church, when the church is taken to be with him, all hell breaks loose on earth. And it begins slowly, but it picks up steam. We're going to see this as we go through these, these verses. One thing after another, a layer after another, after another, after another. And then it finally culminates. We'll be seeing that as we go through the book of Revelation.